I want to thank our, our jurors who helped participate in the Honors and Award adjudication. And maybe they should all stand up. We have Clark, the president of AIA, Clark Manis. Uh, Helen Hatch, who is the secretary of the International Committee, executive. Um, Paul Tange, from Tange Associates, from Japan. And then our, our local contingent was Dominic Lamb, president of HKIA. <laughs> Mr. Peter Cookson-Smith on my right. And Paul Kember from K plus K who couldn't be here tonight. And, and I think you'll be very pleased with the results. There's some surprises there, but it was, it was fascinating to listen to the conversations among the jurors and, and there was a real good rapport and camaraderie and I greatly appreciated how the local knowledge was um, given to the people com from coming from out of state. You know, they don't understand all the implications of some of our buildings and projects and it really helped the jurors make decisions. And so you'll find out about that on November 22nd, which is our, our great party at Exchange Square. Okay, now who else do I have to thank for being here? Well, all our folks from Shanghai. They, they were very, very valuable in our, our round table discussion on the future of AIA and making AIA global. And uh, we had a great meeting today and thank you for participating and, and, and join, joining us on that. Now, one thing, this is our third quarterly, so I have to get to nominations, um, a little bit of chapter business. So currently our ex-co is me, president. Bernard Chang is vice president, was vice president, we'll talk about that later. Uh, Christine Bruckner is our director. Ken Howe is the secretary. And Dennis Salinger came forward as our treasurer. So thank you all for a great year. We've had a re I've had a great time working with all of you and um, Sorry to say, we have to start thinking about next year. And next year, sadly, uh, Bernard's travel schedule doesn't allow him to take up the post of president. So you'll find on your seats nomination forms, and you cannot leave today without filling in a nomination form. We send out these emails every year, but I want you to do it now, even if you're not a member. And, and, and I'm going to help you fill in the blanks. For president next year, Christine Bruckner has stepped forward. And, and I know she'll do a fabulous job. Um, and she enjoys being president, so that's a good thing. But if anybody else wants to do it, please nominate yourselves, because I think the chapter benefits by a variety of leaders. And Christine will still be there to support you as a director. And it's, it's better for the chapter if we don't always repeat our heads. Okay, um, for Vice President, William Lim has stepped forward, so you could fill in William Lim, unless you have another suggestion for Vice President, which means he would be President for the second time in 2013. And also, he'll be great. Uh, for, let's just check, I had a list here. Uh, yes, William Lim would be Vice President for 2012. And for secretary, we have a new member, David Kilpatrick. He's not here tonight, I know, because he's in Manila. Um, and he's a new member, so it's nice to have new people join AIA and participate in EXCO. For treasurer, Nelson Chen wants to give it a go. He's never been treasurer. He's been president. He's been head of many committees, and so he'll be treasurer, unless you have a better su su suggestion. And who else do we have? I think that's it. But we also need committee chairs. And, and this year, I handled programs. Sujata Guvada took care of our urban design events, and it was a collaboration between programs and urban de design committee. Nominations was Nelson Chen. Honors and awards was a team of Greg Lung, Grover Deer, and Christine Bruckner again. Um, membership was handled by Kim Wang, and communications is Roger Dunn. And let me find out who I'm going to recommend for next year. It's on one of these papers. Maybe I left it somewhere. Oh, here we go. 
Okay, so for committees, I've been head of committees for a year and a half now. I've done it several times before, I mean, of programs. I, I'd like to see if somebody else could do it next year. And I'm happy to support you, but we need new people to get involved with new ideas. So chair for the committees, for the programs committee is open. Sujata Govada also is traveling a great deal, so she's asking for help in urban design. So maybe we can get another chair for that committee. Or that can blend into programs because they're related. Uh, nominations. I'm nominating Peter Basmagian. Is he here? <laughs> if he wasn't here, it's a shoe in but if he's here, we'll have to let him have a say about that. Uh, uh, honors and award Grover is going to continue next year as the chair. And, and we're hoping that Moira would continue to support that committee as she's been a big help this year. Um, membership. Moira? Yay. Can we call you vice chair? You might be chair the following year then. <laughs> I want to build some hierarchy into our, our committees so we're guaranteed some support in future years. Uh, for membership, it's Ken Howe, and he'll support Kim Wang. And communications, Roger Dunn has done this many, many, many years. I'm afraid to say how many, Roger Dunn. Um, and I think he's willing to do it until we find a replacement for him. Well, he has no choice. Um, but Joseph Mock is also stepping forward to support Roger. So that looks like our lineup for next year, but there are openings and there are particip and there are um, opportunities for you to participate. And, and to help you encourage that, I created eight great reasons to get involved with AIA Hong Kong. And the first one, of course, is, is learn, education. Um, if you are active in the chapter, you can help guide bro programs to your interests and to your needs. We also, I mean, this is the best part for me is the networking. I've, I've been friends with members here for, how old is the chapter? 15 years almost? 14 years? Anyhow, these, these are very close friends for me, and, and we have a support network. Um, and you develop that by getting involved in the committees and, and participating in events. It's the only way to get to know your members better. Okay, and I'm, I'm taking some tips from our conversation earlier today, too, so thank you to Clark and Tom. Um, professional support. I have no qualms about calling William or Grover or Peter for legal advice, for advice on employees that have applied for a job with me and maybe work for them. You know, we have a, a good little network here. Maybe I shouldn't give away too much, but, um, but it's very valuable, and that's what you gain by being, participating in the chapter. Uh, career, career advancement, of course, that goes without saying. The people you meet here could be your next boss, and what better way to get to know them than over dinner or with cocktails or at one of our famous grumpy hours. Um, Sourcing, we have our corporate affiliates here, some of the best. So you will meet the finest in their field as members of our chapter. Thank you, Dornbrock. Thank you, Bart, Sandy, uh, Autodesk. I can see a few faces here. Am I missing someone? Sorry. Um, okay, sourcing travel. If, you're, if you make it to president of the chapter, you get to go to grassroots, national, regional conferences and represent AIA Hong Kong. And that expands your horizon and your network to become global. And it's valuable. So join a committee, eventually become chair of that committee, get involved in Exco, become president, and then we can nominate you for FAIA. So that's, that's my story. Eight great reasons to get involved in AIA Hong Kong. What else do I have to tell you? Sorry, I'm almost there. Okay, um, during the cocktail, we were spinning slides uh, of activities by Shigeru Ban and by Professor Zhu Jingjiang. And most of you are outside, you might have missed them, but these are all people that are providing disaster assistance in, in various ways. Shigeru Ban has been written up about a great deal times recently about his things with cardboard tubes and uh, housing. And, and these are some images from schools built by students from Chinese University. Uh, they've built two in the past couple years using uh, donations from sponsors and then their own labor. And these schools went up in two weeks.
They were all pre-planned and pre-packaged and delivered on the back of a truck and very scientifically planned to do that. The lighting was all donated by OptiLED, who is also one of our fabulous corporate affiliates. Okay, so that's getting to our topic tonight. It's rebuilding communities. And our main speaker will be Clark Manis, AIA President Clark Manis, who I think has had time to finish his salad. And he is, in addition to be, being president of AIA, he is CEO and design principal for Heller Manis. And, and what's most fitting about Clark, I just read that he was involved in rebuilding San Francisco after the 1989 earthquake. So his involvement in disaster relief and rebuilding goes back quite a long ways. And in addition to Clark, there will be several other speakers. And I think Christine needs to explain a little bit about the format of this evening. Thank you, Jay Lee. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Tonight has a lot of meanings. One is that we're so thrilled to have Clark and Tom and Helen and all of you here. And the other is, it was a letter that was written by the president of our Japan chapter, Hisaya Sugiyama. And it was a 14-page letter, and it moved us all significantly. I, I'm actually not going to read it now because I really want to be in the interest of our speaker's time. But I was just going to say the last part. And basically, after looking and searching for all of the things that are going on around him, he just soul-searched and said, what can we as architects be doing? What can we learn from this? What tips can we give? How can we give something to each other so that we have somewhere to go if this comes again or even in this situation? So immediately an email was sent to Clark, to others, and we started discussing a leadership design forum about rebuilding communities sustainably. And nobody has all the answers. You know, there's some beautiful examples, there's some great things that have happened, but the reality is it's a, there's so much to do. So what the purpose of the workshop side of this will be, first we're going to hear from Clark. Clark Manis will be our keynote speaker. Then we're going to have regional perspectives from HKIA. We're going to have Tony Tang, who's going to share some work. And then we're also going to have George Kunihiro from Japan, so we have regional perspectives. After that, we're going to actually have discussions at your table. And that's why there are numbers, and that's why we've mixed up our guests from abroad and our AIA experts, so that they can actually facilitate, and you can all have some voice in what you think are ways that architects can slot in and help, and also give back and fi figure out how to help the community know what those skills might be and how we might raise that awareness. This is about creating a living document, so the notes that you take that get shared, we'll try to collate, we'll share back out with you, and, and you can fill in with new ideas as you think about them. So right now we're going to be hearing from our, our keynote speakers. Please enjoy your salad, and then we'll do our workshop and enjoy dinner. So um, I'd also like to bring your attention to the deck design here. Our, our um, person today is Ricky. Where's Ricky? There she is. Thank you. If you want to stand up. But she's uh, brought something to us which is, is very special. It's about the spirit of water and she has examples of her work here at the Ritz in Shanghai. She's got great examples. If we want to do tours or some more fun things, we can do those as well. But for tonight, we just thank you for making it possible. And I'd like to invite... Clark Manis, our president, 2011, National AIA president. Just give me a minute here. We'll, we'll swap, swap the laptops here. Hopefully it'll be easy. Um, let, me, uh, let me just start by thanking uh, Jay Lee and, and Christine and enjoy your salad. I, scarfed mine down. Um, and uh, several of you obviously spent last week um, in uh, Tokyo at UIA and um, George Kanahiro, who you're going to hear from, had a, uh, just a significant role in its organization and George will also share what a remarkable experience it was for, for me. Um, attending UIA, which if you don't know is that every three years the a gathering of architectural association 
around the world occurs, uh, and um, the leadership actually gets to sort of meet each other and talk about common issues. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about, which I which I have a, a great passion for, is the importance of disaster and the way architects can be involved in that process. So, um, with that, let, let me just start the talk here and. Um, and then we can discuss some of the things that I think are really important here. Um, these are the things that I want to touch on in the course of what I want to share with you. Some of them are based on my own personal experience in San Francisco. Others are really a part of the AIA's leadership uh, that I believe that's existed for 30 years. Um, and the at the end of it, I think that there's a program that the Institute has put forward about three years ago when I was a vice president called Citizen Architect. And I think Citizen Architects are really a key part of that the dialogue in terms of what society uh, can offer. Um, just, a, just a couple minutes about who I am. Um, so uh, a couple people have always, always asked me, so uh, what's my life like this year and last year? So I live in two worlds. I have a firm in San Francisco. We now have a, an office that we opened in Shanghai. And the firm has existed for 26 years. I, my partner, Jeff Heller, and I uh, have been involved. And the firm does a, a huge um, array of work, everything from uh, hotels, high-rise residential buildings, uh, high-rise office buildings, renovations, renovations like San Francisco City Hall, train stations, and master planning. and, and um, academic building, so pretty pretty broad. We are a uh, mid-sized firm in the vocabulary of what's happening in the architectural field. Uh, we're unique in that we're not supposed to actually exist in the future. Everybody says small firms and big firms, but uh, I think the culture of mid-sized firms are really a part of it, and I, though I know many of you are really a part of that. Um, we have been fortunate, and uh, having had the benefit of uh, spending time with many of you um, and hearing your own opportunities in Asia, uh, we too have been lucky in the course of the last six years to begin to develop a very robust profile in China and pretty much in every major city, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Guangzhou, and many other what would be called second tier cities in the US. Uh, you would never call them that because there are five million or more. Uh, everything from master planning to a, a high rise building in Shanghai that uh, we believe to be uh, actually the first lead gold uh, office building. Uh, Guangzhou has been the in the intent. I know that in talking to some of you, you've been doing work there. It's a real opportunity. Uh, we were first hired a couple years ago uh, by the mayor and the planning uh, director to actually look at the core plan. Um, because our practice has really resided in San Francisco, we have a lot of urban context experience. And those of you who have been working in China, it's really interesting because they are really seeking for a change in the vocabulary of what they're doing. Doing. And so everything from an, a an analysis of what occurred in the core in the north axis to a larger scope in the south axis, some of the stuff has been built and we've been talking about transportation networks and pedestrian networks and the, the importance of those things in the design process. So design is really something that we've always felt is important and as I said, this building that actually just finished in um, in Shanghai is is considered to be one of the first Lee Gold high rise. We did the first one in San Francisco, so uh, our portfolio is really about trying to aspire to uh, greater levels of sustainability in terms of building typology. So the theme of the discussion here uh, really is about disaster, and uh, a little little history here is in the last 30 years, the AI has really had a remarkably robust program in terms of what its disaster assistance profile has been about. But um, about two, three years ago, um, as a result of the budget, uh, the institute decided that you know that was not an opportunity. And last year, uh, I decided that it was very important, and I wanted to actually put it back on the table. Um, and I appointed Rachel Minery, some of you may know, to chair the Disaster Assistance Task Force. And she's done a wonderful job of actually bringing that back in terms of the experience. And so um, 
with that, if you begin to look at what we all see, which is really this continued escalation of disasters around the world, and you know, you, you, you pick your poison, whether it's an earthquake or a mudslide or a tornado or a typhoon, as, I've, as Carol and I have now begun to experience here, which is a unique thing in terms of it being three or four or five or not there or not, um, it's a unique thing. But um, those of you who were in, um, New Orleans, and the image on the right really is about what happened five years ago in, in, after Katrina, uh, and the U.S. is, in my mind, inability to actually help that community. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about, and, and George will too, about what I saw uh, in Japan when a group of us went up to Sendai, and Japan is actually far more prepared in its ability to actually recover uh, after a disaster of this magnitude. Uh, so everything from temporary shelters, uh, uh, Jay Lee talked about Shigeru Bond stuff. I had the opportunity to meet him uh, and talk a little bit about disasters and his work uh, up in Sendai. And he is really committed. Uh, and it's really inspired that somebody of that caliber is really in, is inspired to really participate in that. So if you look at, in the US, you look at the FEMA analysis. And there's actually two images here, one that's a little bit easier. A continued escalation of disasters over time. And if you look at the chart as it goes back from 1960 and the amount that's going forward, it just seems to be uh, nonstop. Um, so you look at the, the hazards here, and you know, again, I, I just want to reiterate this. You know, it's a wildfire, it's a flood, it's a hurricane, it's a severe storm, it's an earthquake. Um, and the thing that, that I've been talking a lot about. And I know that it's probably been out there, and, and engineers tend to talk about it a little bit as well, is the importance of resilient and sustainable communities as a result of a disaster. And, and you really look at ways um, that, those, that, that you learn from those lessons of what the disaster is and the way that your community can actually rebuild itself better, and you learn from that. The UIA experience really, in my mind, is really about how peers around the world can share those lessons and help each other. Because when those disasters occur, um, unless there is that community capital uh, for people to actually feel that they're bonded to uh, help each other, and at the outset of any disaster, you know, the first effort really is about survival instinct. It's about water, food, medicine, uh, your family's uh, safety. Um, and then what evolves is the people's desire to get to normalcy, which really is, is not going to happen. It takes a long time for that to occur. And the extremes, and I've used this often, is the extreme between if you look at Japan compared to Haiti. Uh, the AI has been involved for almost two years in trying to help Haiti in terms of our effort. We've been talking to some of the folks in the government. But the, the, the nature of building codes and the importance of building codes, which we all know we utilize, really is a key way that we can actually help health, safety, and welfare, which are key aspects of what architects are really responsible for. Um, I clipped this, and I know this is really hard to find, and I'll be more than happy to share with you. I discovered this about a week ago. But um, this was a diagram uh, that a group called um, uh, Disaster Surgeons put together. And what it actually indicates is that, that FEMA is actually running out of money to fund the support on disasters, which is a very frightening thing. And, and what it actually looks at is it looks at the statistics on the different disasters. And this little chart, and I'm a big advocate lately of infographics, if any of you have been watching them. They really provide a visual representation of what the character of those things are. And this little chart here actually summarizes why it's a really big problem, and it's happening in the US, and it's going to happen globally. So two examples, and I've touched on both of them. I'm going to talk about them a little bit more. So Katrina. So um, right after Katrina, I think I'm very proud of the AI's efforts to help its members. And those of you who were there in New Orleans actually saw a very, um, a very uh, rebuilt professional community uh, doing a, a remarkable amount of work. Uh, but what's really very unfortunate to see, and if you had a chance to go down to the Ninth Ward, is that after five years, they have barely put back together. Now, Brad Pitt um, has been really involved in his effort on the Make It Right Foundation, and you may know a little bit about that, and well as other firms uh, that are actually look at creative solutions. Uh, our local uh, New Orleans architects, Wagner and Ball, have been looking at water management program. And, um, 
the thing that, that was really evident to me in the discussion with the folks from Sendai is that you really have to use architectural thinking to get people to consider not rebuilding in places where they should not be. They should be on higher ground. Um, and that's a really difficult thing. People don't want to change their mindset about being able to do that. They, they think that that's always been their home and there's no other choice. But you need to do that. And this study in New Orleans was actually looking at how to deal with the, the water efforts in terms of rebuilding. Uh, other efforts in terms of that involved a 21st century uh, plan that Goody Clancy out of Boston was working on with the city in order to change the mindset. Now, um, the mayor at that time, Ray Nagin, uh, and I, w I would say was not confident about his ability as a leader to be able to change the mindset of people in that community to think about living in places that, that were not vulnerable in, in, in a disaster. And I think that's the fundamental shortcoming of policymakers. I consistently say that the poly policymakers are really a part of the responsibility and we as architects all need to be in a place where we're able to talk to them about the logic of what they're what we're able to do. The Make It Right, which I identified here, has got a series of houses. It's a, it's a very interesting um, uh, composition of, of houses that are really aspiring to a higher level of sustainability. And um, it, it's, it's a unique thing that actually a, a movie star who lives in New Orleans took the opportunity because he did not see government actually stepping into action. And this is where private sector actually really has an opportunity to be able to step forward in that stuff. So my, my own experience, and this goes back now more than 20 years, was um, I was a, a young architect and uh, I felt there was a real need after the 89 earthquake uh, to look at what was a part of a, a, tra a traffic artery for cars. It was an elevated freeway. There's a lot of them over here. But in a seismic zone like San Francisco, um, those uh, structures obviously didn't fare well. The one that was in the East Bay collapsed and killed several people killed many people, I think 60. This one did not, but what it did was it, it had been built in the 60s as a result of improvement in uh, what people believed was the best way for their cars to get from point A to point B. So the earthquake happened and the, the, the dynamic here is that uh, I, I assembled a group uh, who did an urban design study and in the course of it what we really were looking at, I'm going to advance forward here, these are some of the things that you remember seeing there, was we did a urban design study. 20 years ago, it clearly was not as sophisticated as any of the ones that we do now, but the point was that we were intent on lobbying policymakers. And um, I was fortunate that the mayor of San Francisco, Art Agnes, uh, and I, who actually got to know each other over the course of the years, actually pulled me out of the crowd and wanted me to come talk to him about what I thought the important things in that city were about and what the options are. And as much as we all think that aesthetics are important, public safety is actually more important. And the thing that won the day after a long, arduous fight at the Board of Supervisors was the importance of public safety and the importance of how we could protect uh, the public in the event of not having structures that would be vulnerable in the event of an earthquake. Now, the side benefit, which is really the best thing that came out of it, and those of you who have been to San Francisco, was a rebirth of an area that was really essence of the city. And, and we all know cities that we live in and we visited, that that freeway actually had eliminated the character and the connection to the waterfront. What's happened in the course of the two decades, and I have been involved in, in a pro bono effort as a chair of a citizens advisory committee on multiple things. So everything from the transformation of hist historic resource in the ferry building, creation of art, the ferry building on the left there, hotels on the left, pedestrian activity along this promenade over there. And then what actually then ultimately happened was two other areas that were part of the connection from the where the Embarcadero connected to the, the Bay Bridge was the creation of two high-rise, high-density urban residential areas. Now, in Hong Kong, that's uh, probably uh, not something that you take note of because the city is the epitome of density. And every time I come here, I'm just inspired by the scale of it. And it's remarkable. But for San Francisco, who was always afraid of heights, it actually enabled the creation and the zoning for 
7,000 units of housing in those two areas over there. And what's happened as a result of that is now the, the goal to create high-speed rail connections in the city. So this domino effect of a bad event has actually given the ability for the city to actually uh, create a character that it didn't have before. And I think uh, the, those people who now have come to live downtown really see the benefit of that. And many who were the opponents of it think back and don't even remember why the fight was so hard and why, the, why were, they were seriously against it. And so these are images of what those areas are in terms of the height and San Francisco, which, is, which was always height averse. I, I like it if you've ever read um, Herb Cain in, uh, when he was alive. He was a guy who thought that San Francisco should be shrink-wrapped and frozen in a, in a 1930s vocabulary. That was the essence of the city and they didn't want any more height. And so this was a significant transformation. I I chaired this, this Citizens Advisory Committee for over 10 years because I felt that as an architect it was my obligation to continue to press for something that I felt had great societal value. And so you see the scattering of things and you see uh, what the city's become. So just sort of coming back to the thing that I said, which I think is a really key part of this, and the Institute really has put this back on the front burner, the importance of creating resilience in the communities. And if you, you pair resilience and you compare, compare sustainability together, what you really end up is people's aspirations to create communities that actually will be able to, not weather, but be able to sustain the kind of natural disasters, and in some cases, man-made disasters in the way it occurs in the way of what could occurs in them being self-sufficient and being able to do that. And so UIA's dialogue and one of their work commissions is intent on looking this around the world so that we can as a profession help each other in, in what we look at. So Japan, I want to talk a little bit about Japan and I know George has got some really good stuff to show. So we all saw six months ago what happened there. The earthquake, the tsunami made it worse, and the nuclear disaster. So a group of us went up uh, during UIA. Uh, eight of us went up to Sendai. Uh, and um, the thing that you obviously see as a result of the news and the sort of repair there was um, a truly remarkable thing for me. And I didn't know whether this was going to be the case or whether I, I would expect this. But um, they, in the course of the last six months, have removed 60% of the debris that actually was created as a result of, of that uh, disaster. Now, the other statistic which really astounded me is that there was very little building damage as a result of the earthquake. And those of you who have experienced earthquakes, a 9.0 earthquake is a significant amount. The one that I experienced in 89 was seven, nothing in comparison. The tsunami made it worse. It, it basically destroyed buildings as a result of the force of water. The, the, the videos that they showed us showed the remarkable power of that you saw it on that. And so what's really happened in that country, and I told uh, Tasha Arhar, who is the president of JIA, that he should be very proud of Japan's efforts to actually work to bring their country back. And if you compare the, the, what, what has been this sort of somewhat difficult thing to watch in Haiti, where they really haven't even gotten back to that. And so the importance of building codes and the importance of design and the importance of materials is really something that we all do. Other opportunities, some of you may be aware of this, which was really something that was really great to see. We met the first morning with a group called Archiade, okay? And it is the Ch Japan's version of uh, architecture for humanity. And many of you know about uh, Cameron Sinclair and Kate Storr's efforts to uh, create a uh, benevolent uh, program and looking at helping around the world. But this was a group of, of two, this was two professors who actually felt that they would step to action. They put together a program, they assembled students, and they are now working, as they said, with many fishing villages that were destroyed as a result of the tsunami that don't have any life now. And they joked that they had to spend a couple days drinking with the fishermen to make sure that they, the fishermen felt comfortable with that. And now the students are beginning to help them in a planning process of, of putting their communities back into place because they have been left with nothing. And 
Archeade, I think, is one that, for me, and I was aware of it, but meeting the founders of it actually made it more important. So back to UIA. UIA as an organization is one that we're somewhat aware of and some of us are involved in, but it is the bonding of professional associations around the world. And their agenda is a multi-tier agenda. George can elaborate a little bit more on it. And it really is, a, is, is more about a networking. But there are strategic programs that I do think that UIA can do that each of our organizations are able to do, but they're able to actually, it's, it enables all of us to connect in a much more robust way with peers around the world about lessons learned and case studies about how we would deal with things. And the AIA has been involved in a variety of things like that, but this actually reinforced for me the importance of that. So when you look at our own AIA's disaster assistance program over the last 30 years, we've actually put that in place. You look at the, the differentiation between the way we deal with emergency and first responders, everything to relief, and the view that architects actually have that long view, that you can look at how your communities can actually get rebuilt. The one that I often use, and I'm, I'll come to in a minute here, is the one in Greensburg, Kansas. So we have been intent in the ones, the disasters in this last year in Joplin, Mississippi, Tuscaloosa, uh, in helping architects to be trained to be able to go in and evaluate buildings. That is the first big challenge where architects can be in a role where they're helping the public and government officials in terms of what those are. And you see the kind of disasters that the Institute has been involved in. And we have a, a really much better program, rapid damage assessment in terms of what that is, an analysis of that. And um, the, the big concern that a lot of us have is, um, is trying to get in all of the states a good Samaritan law. It does not exist in every, every state, which is a real challenge for architects who really want to help. And so we're intent on a sort of federal level to look at what those opportunities are. AI Alabama touched on the tornado in terms of what those things are and the scope of the disaster and how the volunteer efforts actually really made a difference in the community. And, and I said this earlier today, grassroots leadership is really important in doing that. The national organization can be there as to help and aid, but it is really the local grassroots AIA components that are really involved in doing that. And so again, you look at the importance of architects and long-term recovery, you know, the make it right is a really good example of that. The unique profile of building sustainable homes in a place that the public, those people who lived in those communities, didn't, were not aware of that. So now they've been, they've now been exposed to why design is an important vocabulary in terms of what recovery is about. Greensburg. Greensburg, five years ago, was hit by an F5 tornado. Literally a town that was devastated. AI leadership in Kansas with the mayor, who is now the governor, actually five years later has created a sustainable and resilient community. One that really, that the profession and the community should be very proud of. And if you, if you Google that, you can see what they've really been able to do. So it's, a, it's that long view and comprehensive view. Lastly, I just want to conclude by saying that, um, and, I, and I, I mentioned this earlier, citizen architects and the role that we play in our communities are important. You know, the public in many instances do not have the opportunity to really understand the way architects are involved in helping their communities. And you, you, it broadening this dialogue and the importance of, of this diagram where there are issues that we believe are important that you want to educate the public. I go back to my own experience and being involved in my own community on an issue that I felt was important. People said to me for years, why are you continuing to do this? I did it because I felt that it was my contribution to my community. And each of you do that, and each of you need to con do that and reinforce that for a younger generation who has that value. And I think there, that value does exist there. We sometimes get lost in, in, the, in the work that our firms do or the teaching that we do and feeling that we don't have the time to do it. But this is a great contribution that we can do. And so it's not just about buildings. It's really about a cultural heritage that we think is, is really important in the rebuilding process. And it really is about building, helping communities rebuild their spirit. I said earlier, it's really about that community capital that you want to reinforce. And ultimately, when you see a youth generation feeling that there is hope, there really is something that you actually get really this great warm feeling about. So with that, I want to thank you. And uh, I guess, uh, Christine, I'm going to turn it over to George, right? 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Clark. We're actually going to ask our HKIA representative, Tony Tang, to share his experiences um, next. And then, George, last but not least, we look forward to your insights as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, this one. one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Tony Tang, and tonight I'm speaking on behalf of our president, uh, Mr. Dominic Lamb. Uh, thank you, AIA Hong Kong chapter, for inviting us to share our experience in uh, Sichuan. So as you may aware that um, Hong Kong is quite a safe city in terms of natural disasters. So, but we, very often we heard about the uh, region around us, they are suffering from tsunamis, suffering from earthquake. In the past, uh, Hong Kong architects very often, um, they work individually to assist certain NGOs to work in, in Indonesia, in Japan, in other regions, as an individual to help in the uh, the disasters relief and also we donate money to some uh, international organizations to help in the relief. It is until um, 2008, that is three years ago, when Sichuan uh, is hit by the earthquake, that we start, this is the first time we put ourselves in action, uh, our organized kind, to uh, assist the people there. Okay, um, on May uh, 12, it is three months before the Beijing Olympic, that uh, Sichuan is hit by the um, earthquake and over uh, 100,000 casualties and 80% of the areas were destroyed. So um, we quickly, um, well the sentiment in Hong Kong is that uh, we want to find a way to, to help and the Hong Kong architects uh, asked how, how we can help and we quickly formed ourselves into a task force and over hundreds of members expressed their interest. And at the same time, we have many calls from our partners that the, the NGOs we usually working with and from some of the friends that they have been going to Sichuan and then they are start to do some work but they don't have the technical know-how so they want us to give assistance. So, the, um, so we quickly organize ourselves into, um, into different groups. Next one. And then uh, we pull ourselves into, we find some people that will be willing to travel, so they, they will be the on-site group to give uh, on-site supervision. We have our group to do research. The, in the university, they do research to support us, because in Hong Kong, we, don't, we can build um, skyscrapers, uh, malls in, in mainland China, but we don't build village houses with earthquake resistance in China. Okay, and then we quickly form ourselves into different groups, and at the same time, that uh, we sort out the, the plans from various NGOs and then we find one uh, that is, well, that we worth to invest ourselves into that. And next one. And this is uh, uh, a plan proposed by Amity, which is an NGO. They have operations in both mainland and, um, and in Hong Kong. They approach us and that they told us that they have signed an agreement with local government that they are looking after a village called Wa Yun. That uh, village is, uh, have a population of around uh, uh, 2,500 people, uh, 900 families, and hun almost 100% of the houses were destroyed during the earthquake. They have uh, uh, 50 casualties during the earthquake. So um, we joined them to go to the site. Then this is a photo we taken in, um, in August uh, 2008. Just, uh, three months after the earthquake. So the temporary settlement is taken care by the government. So we, and also the, um, the temporary leaving, the, the is looking after. So we are going there to look for the long-term rebuilding, resettlement, and how to make it happen. Next one. So, um, so we quickly meet with the NGO, and with the NGO is very important because we cannot talk Sichuan dialect. We do not have any trust from the village people. And the Amity have been working there for almost three months, so they have trust from the people. They provide funding to certain, um, to certain rebuilding. So we, through the NGO, we talk directly with the people to see what they need, what is the house size they want. And this is very interesting. When we when the, in the first time, when we meet with the village people and they talk about their own house, oh, they want this back and that back. When we measure the house they got, 
they thought that is the good house. That is often 20% or 30% smaller than what they say. So on-site um, uh, investigation is very important. Otherwise, they will be building something beyond their financial uh, support and taking up more land and that eat, eat up the uh, agricultural land that reduce their future production. So, um, and then we go to the study and then also we find that because that uh, 900 houses is developed, divided into 60 groups, all are natural settlement. It's not very logical. For example, the, in terms of the modern city, the transportation system is not very efficient. When farmers carry their farm produce back to their own home, they need to walk along a meandering lanes, and which is not direct. And when they take, want to take their farm produce from their store to get it out to the market, it's also very difficult, not efficient. Say, for example, the irrigation system, again, they, some, some houses, some group of houses is building on the lowland, which is flood every summer. And also, that um, for village like this kind, this is the drainage system. They don't have a very good drainage system, so the toilet is drained to the, um, drained to the septic tank. And every month, that people come to collect the waste and that to use it. At the, but the septic tank may be in front of other people's main entrance. So this is what we saw. OK, so when we take this, so we slowly work with the planners. Peter, are you here? Hong Kong IP is there. OK, so, so we work with the planners, work with the engineers to get derive a plan. Of course, the plan is a very conceptual plan, but we uh, told them the ideas. What is the behind of that plan? OK, next one. So and then we also derive some house type because they have small families. They have uh, mid-sized families. They have big families. So we use their prototype, uh, replan that, um, and with the input of the engineers and the, and the planners to rebuild certain, certain buildings, uh, free building types. We call it, uh, there's a two-bay free room, which is for a uh, free family, a uh, small family. And then the next one. And next one. This is the fee bay five room. This is a standard one, which is uh, very commonly uh, uh, accepted in and fit their living style. And then the next one. And this is a four bay um, seven rooms, which is uh, for the large family. So we pre when we so we we heard about their desire. We listened to them and we go to walk around that. We develop these three types of buildings, and then we and then the next one. We develop. Uh, this is a social center. Okay, this, um, we, we learned, this we learned from Japan. We also sent uh, people to go to Japan to learn about the schools in Japan, how they uh, build up, the, uh, strengthen the school, school so that uh, when the residential houses are collapsed, the school is still there. And this is a relief center with uh, storage of uh, food during the disastrous time so that we, we incorporate that into this kind of social center so that we in t if in case another disaster has come, this will be the last support for the village people. So the next one. So with this uh, and the planning input, we developed uh, several prototypes of the village settlement so that the, uh, the septic tank will not be in front of another people's main door. Um, the house will be close to the road so that they can get the produce easily in and out. And, and they, they move away from the uh, flooded area so that they can have a dry um, and livable uh, space um, all the year round. So we developed this. Okay, and then the problem is that we developed this, this in Hong Kong. And then we cannot uh, very often on site to seek their feedback. So the NGO provide a, a, a bridge, a channel, so that once we develop a set of plans, we email to them and they talk with the village people and then feedback. So it is uh, the first time we visit them in August, and then three months later, we have a set of quite mature plan and bring that back to the, um, to the village, and they accepted that. So we, we draw up when the people, when the village people, first time, so this is the first time ever in their life, saw a computer animated a building of the future, they are very excited, but they know what it is. So they constantly give their feedback, so we finalize our plan, and then they can start the building work. This is not the end of the story. The next phase is coming. Um, in China, in that program, um, the state is sponsoring one third of the fund for building their own home. 
So our plans are not drawn by uh, mainland professionals. So how can we get the funding? Fortunately, that um, the institute get a connection to the Ministry of Construction in Beijing via Ministry of Construction that they pass a message down to the province, to the to the county, to the village said, okay, this is something from Hong Kong qualified professionals. So with this, that we talk with the government officials so that they quickly accept that this set of uh, Hong Kong professional prepared plans can be accepted as their own standard. So once they use this set of plans, they can have the government subsidies. Okay, and no, just back, yes. And the second thing is that because we are way and they are village people, how can they form a contract with the contractor to build their home? Because still worth something compared to them, compared with us is very minimal. Each house costs about um, 10,000 US. It's a, a small sum, but to them it's a big sum. Okay, we work with the NGO, they have the mainland lawyers, so that we work out a very simple uh, building contract so that the, the villagers can find their own contractors to, to build this house with a, with a proper contractual relationship. And the last thing is that how to supervise. Okay, because um, they, they may know nothing about, okay, although we design with um, local apparatus, that, uh, that is the grade of concrete is minimal, the steel is a nominal steel and with bricks, with tiles. But how can, how, how can we assure that the contractor are built according to the specifications? Okay, with the engineers, with the architects here, we drop a very uh, standard handbook, just uh, like um, uh, comics, very graphical. For, and then we have one of our um, members who is also a teacher in, in, the, um, in the university. So he bring up the, the simplified booklet, graphical form, stay there for two weeks, and then teach the village uh, people how, how you should look, how you should, what you should check. So you should check how many columns, at least how many reinforcement there, things like that. So because they are very concerned about that because it's their own home. There's nobody cared their own home um, much more than, than, than themselves. So this works. Okay. So this is a building under, under construction. Okay, there's a little story that uh, some of the people, some of the rich people, when they get set, that set of plans, they are, they, are, they are rich, well, comparatively rich. So they don't need uh, the government's money. So they start building their own without our construction supervision input. So and then when the time when we arrive on site, we quickly find out that that house, that particular house, missed out two columns. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the case. So we, okay, so uh, we get the feedback and in Hong Kong, we ask the engineer to get uh, two details, how to add the column back. And then all others just listen to us and follow quietly that follow the procedure. And then they, do, they don't want to risk the quality, the safety of their house. The next one. So this is um, this is uh, in um, 200. Um, this uh, uh, two, four months ago when we go back to Warren, and then this is the all the houses are completely uh, a, a, a typical one. So they do some quite modification, but basically they follow the same principle of of building of of what we we told them. Next one. And this, here is the group, and from the back, you see this, all the village people. Here is the village chief, and this is the social center we, we talk about. And this is all these people who supervise their own house. They sign on the certificate to pay money to the main contractor. And the, this particular uh, village people, and ask her, do you afraid to talk with the main contractor to withhold their payment, things like that, to confront with the main contractor? She said, don't. Because I know that if I don't sign, he didn't got the payment. <laughs> yes. And that now they are exporting this kind of a professional knowledge because she is um, uh, she's from another village. When her, how to say, her mother village is have some building works, that she go back to teach their own family how, what, you, what is the critical thing you have to look after. The next one. And at the same time, apart from this project, the um, Hong Kong government initiated another, another task force. This is a much bigger one. 
that um, it involves all the engineers, surveyors, planners, landscape architects, and all the construction industry in Hong Kong to help Sichuan in a much larger scale. So um, when the government go up to Sichuan, they almost solicit over 100 projects that the Hong Kong community have. This is all Hong Kong funding. So uh, we quick uh, under the, the flat of the government, so the, um, the construction professionals from a round table. So to give, it is basically, uh, we are giving advice, uh, technical advice, so that when they drop the plans that uh, they will engage local professionals to design. But for things like hospitals, of course, we have a better knowledge of how hospital works so that we give our input. So next one. So we divide into um, four categories. This is according to the building part. Say one, the first one is schools. So we, what we learned from Japan, we can translate to our requirement to those um, local projects. And hospitals that um, also that uh, we, we translate our knowledge on hospital to help to improve their local planning and local uh, design of the hospital. And social welfare facilities. And the last one is uh, the natural reserve for the pandas. For the pandas, it's very, very interesting because we have never designed something for pandas. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, we have the um, ocean park so that we go to ocean park to learn about how they raise a panda. Um, and then we also go, uh, go to the jockey cup to see how they treat big animals. So this is something we learn. Then we, we translate our knowledge to give advice to, the, uh, to that 160 something project. Um, and also um, that uh, we also assist the government to attend some expert panels to review the, some major projects. The, the several major projects are the Panda Center in uh, Wolong and in Daojiang Yan, and also the, um, the provincial hospital. Then there's uh, two provincial hospital that we attend panel meetings in the mainland. Yeah. So this is a, a summary of the, all the projects uh, we've done to, with the government. There are 29 hospitals, uh, 50 schools, uh, 11 social welfare facilities, and 12 um, projects for the natural reserve. It's all for the pandas. So um, this is the, uh, the completed work of the government projects. And this is the... Uh, this is the Panda Center, the Panda House. Yeah, um, all together um, in this, uh, we have spent uh, over 3,000 man hours for the uh, Sichuan relief work and, over, and assist in one, over 100 projects. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, that was one more perspective is coming, just a, a few minutes, and then we're actually going to encourage all of you to use the one unusual utensil, which is the pencil, and we're going to actually work on our workshop for a short while. Um, so, but George, would you please come up and share with us a bit about the Japan regional perspective? George Kunihiro, FAIA, President of ARC Asia. Uh, thank you, Christine and uh, Jay Lee. Thank you for inviting me here and uh, to meet all the uh, AIA Hong Kong people. And I just basically just follow Clark and uh, and uh, Tom and uh, and uh, Helen just you know after this thing. And when I arrived, they're already here. But uh, what I'm going to talk about, and and she said. Uh, Christine said only 10 minutes or 8 minutes or something, so I got to go really quick. Um, I don't know. So I'll, I'll just run this in the background. Um, and uh, the background is not running. <laughs> Maybe you don't wanna, you don't want to see this because uh, let's see how does it work? Is it running? Hmm? Hold on a second. Hmm. 
Well, it doesn't matter. I, 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 there was a, a news clip uh, of, uh, of the tsunami um, that ran for like seven minutes. I was going to let it run and, 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 and you know, make you lose the appetite. But uh, anyways, um, the, uh, the talk, talk is about the perspective of what we experienced in, uh, in Japan uh, in, three, uh, in March 11th. Um, and what the uh, architects did, and I think uh, Clark already talked about Archeaid and uh, the efforts of architects. Uh, I would like to share uh, my feeling, I think, in general, because we're all eager to help uh, in, in, the, uh, in times of the disaster. But, you know, the, I, I think I mentioned this in, uh, in New Orleans, you know, uh, architects come last. Uh, because to, well, I don't know about Hong Kong or I don't know about the United States, but in Japan, uh, architects are what we call, let's say, contractors, let's say. Uh, we're here to, uh, in Japan, the government sees us as a contractor, in a sense, not a professional, because, uh, you know, we go to get projects from the government and bid on it and so on, and everything's based on uh, fees. So the, the professionalism is not really well respected in, uh, in Japan, whereas the large construction company, design build, build companies, are the ones that really have the uh, ins with the government. So the independent architects, uh, what we do, uh, we're e eager to help, but it's very difficult to, uh, to uh, be able to work with the government initially. And so in the case of the Japan Institute of Architects, JIA, or let's say some of the uh, professional associations, the best that we can do uh, is to evaluate uh, buildings. I think Clark mentioned that it was done in New Orleans and so on. You know, uh, we get qualifications and uh, we have license to inspect. And so the government hires us to uh, somehow uh, call upon these places to uh, to check on the the safety of the buildings. Well, that's not enough for for uh, for our eagerness to help. And uh, so, um, I just want to. Is this running? All the all the videos are not running. I'm I'm really sorry if if, if it's running. Well, anyway, I just want to show you all this uh, the, the 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 situation. This is a this is a slides of uh, uh, photos of the, uh, the scene, I think it back in uh, May, uh, this was shown uh, to Clark in a meeting in New Orleans by uh, my colleague Hiroto Kobayashi when he went uh, a few days back, uh, before that to, uh, to the area to, to take these photos. Uh, one of the things that's uh, interesting, I just want to, these are some anecdotes and things, but uh, the, uh, when Clark went to uh, Sendai uh, last week, or this week, or was it last week, uh, he, he, he said that the debris are all gone, which means that um, what I heard was uh, in the public streets, the, the debris were uh, swept away very quickly. And you can do that public, in, the, in public arena. I think the uh, self-defense force and some of the American embassy uh, uh, groups went as, as well to, to, to clean up the streets. But the private properties, they could not remove all the debris because the insurance. And so uh, six months after uh, this uh, uh, 311, if and I haven't been there. If the 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 uh, the landscape was all sort of you know swept away and clean cleaned up, it means that the insurance industry is is very efficient in carrying out uh, all the assessment and so on. So that the next step, which is to clean up the the whole whole uh, uh, this kind of landscape, uh, has been realized. So. Uh, when you talk about the efficiency of how Japan works in terms of, uh, of disaster, uh, post-disaster uh, evaluation and, uh, and uh, pre preparation for, for uh, reconstruction must be very, very efficient. And that sort of brings me to another anecdote. Um, I, as the president of Arcasia, which is the um, 
uh, a group, a regional group that uh, uh, is the uh, council of 18 uh, institute presidents of, of each of the national institute, and, and, and Dominic will be sitting there next year in, the, in, our, in our council meeting. Um, we have our own um, effort here. We, we attempted to somehow help in the effort in Japan. Although I am uh, based in Japan, um, I didn't want to go and do too much of this because uh, there was confusion. Uh, during that time, in, uh, Indonesian Institute of Architects, they offer to send 20 water purifiers to Japan. And they're turned down because the specification for this purifier was below the standards of disaster relief or whatever in Japan. Another uh, tie, the Siamese Institute of Architects, they work with the disaster relief organization, the NGO in, in, in Bangkok, and we're working, uh, beginning to work closely with them. We heard from, through the Thai ASA, their effort to help in Japan. And they're turned down. They say, we'll call you. So when we, and I think I was talking to Greg or somebody, um, uh, in Japan, which is a developed country, it will be very, very difficult to organize to somehow go in and, and work uh, to, for this kind of situation. And so if it's difficult for the foreign NGOs to come in, and I know I, I, I had been in, uh, in 2004, I was in uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, I, I sort of did the whole uh, survey of the post-tsunami in Sri Lanka, where uh, like lots of money, NGOs are there, hundreds of NGOs with, you know, Mercedes uh, all over the place. And, you know, NGO live uh, that way. You know, they get lots of money. They get to live in the uh, five-star hotels and they do their NGO business. But anyways, the money goes to the government. The government uh, uh, sort of hired uh, or, or let the, uh, the institute architects do uh, the re reconstruction. And the problem there was that the architects did pro bono these projects, but there were no citizens' participation. So citizens, you know, didn't, didn't prefer, the, 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 the displaced, uh, you know, citizens, the, the, the victims, did really like the projects that they were forced to live in. Whereas in, in, in my situation, when I went to, to Sri Lanka to uh, be with a friend of mine who was working in a different way with the community participation of, of the victims, the, the whole village. Uh, he, went, he went in there to, to actually bring in models, drawings and everything to make them understand where they're going to live and they will, they'll do the simulation in, in, in the sand, you know, draw the, the, the plot and so on and, uh, and make sure that they understand. And what, com what came out was when they're displaced, uh, they, because they had to live it further inland. When they were displaced, they didn't want to live in the same formation of the neighborhood because maybe they didn't like the neighbors, you know, so they wanted to live far away from it. So it was a whole matrix of understanding in, in terms of planning for this new community. So that was really uh, an interesting thing. But uh, anyways, um, I just want to show you because this is going to be the background. I, I, I had to go very quickly. Um, the Archie aid that Clark mentioned, I'm one of the, 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 the 236 architects there. It was uh, organized by two architects from that region, uh, which was hit, uh, it just happened to be hit, the university where the architecture department is. Uh, the, the, the building uh, was uh, deemed un unsafe and, and uh, will be demolished, but those two professors, uh, one now in UCLA, uh, is a chairman there in UCLA, Toshiabe, and uh, another colleague from this university set up this arcade uh, to really to create an international network of architects to organize to assist the efforts of uh, re reconstruction in this regional platform. And also to reestablish the architectural education in, the, in this region because the schools are hit. And in fact, the, uh, the, 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 the universities couldn't uh, uh, you know, conduct classes in the, uh, uh, in the region. And 
The third is the development of uh, practical methodology for reconstruction, really to really understand. And, and finally, the dissemination of information. And so, uh, Archeade came in because, as I told you, the institute was not effective. The government doesn't deal with architects. So they got together, the young architects got together, and uh, they, they uh, utilized the help of students to uh, conduct the workshop that Clark mentioned. It's called, it was called a summer camp in uh, Tohoku kind of thing. And they were uh, picked up really in the, in the magazine, in the uh, Japan Times, in the newspapers. Uh, 27 architects, 84 students, uh, they went in to do this Archeade summer camp and uh, try to work with different communities in, uh, in uh, Ojika Peninsula uh, in the last, uh, last few months. And this is the area that they went in with different teams. Um, I didn't join because that's another thing, you know, although I, I'm for it, the architects, eager to build, eager to help, eager to, is too eager to build. And sometimes they don't want to hear, the community doesn't want to hear architects come in and say, can we help you build? Because they're psychologically damaged. And so it's, you know, for us to, to, to come in to be a professional, sometimes is not, a correct, meth correct sort of way, I think. And so, um, like for example, this uh, this is w a good um, sort of a, uh, a manual, let's say, a good method networking with uh, the university uh, research group uh, on the information on how to live in a temporary housing facility because they'll be, they're displaced. And this what Tony just mentioned the uh, the school uh, gymnasium and so forth uh, in a condition like this and uh, during the uh, Kobe uh, earthquake in 1991 something like that the temporary housing were built and many uh, and, and some of the some of the, 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 the refugees live for two years and there's such a high rate of suicide uh, because of the way that these things were 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 planned, uh, there were there were, uh, uh, created loneliness, you know, insecurity, and so on, and and many many uh, elderly just uh, you know committed suicide. So these psychological damage and and so on uh, has to be uh, analyzed and understood, and not just so eager to build. Uh, although it is necessary to build this kind of thing. Uh, now, learning from the uh, Kobe earthquake, uh, these uh, temporary shelters and so on uh, are, are planned in different ways. For example, looking at each other, for example, the, the, the entrance or the, the uh, living room is looking at each other so they can go out and look at each other to make sure that, that uh, you know, you're secured and make sure that uh, you know, your, your mind is, is secure, that uh, people around you uh, are, are, uh, are there for the community. And so, the condition's really bad, and, and, uh, and it's, it's going to continue for two or three years. In the meantime, uh, besides RPA, eager architects, and these are my colleagues as well too, uh, went to build things like this temporary fisherman's uh, workspace very quickly, and uh, working with the university students. Uh, you know, students are eager to build, so they, they go and do it. And uh, really learning and drinking with, like Clark said, drinking with, uh, with the uh, fishermen. And the uh, evacuation, evacuation center in, uh, in, in these schools. And again, uh, just following up on um, Clark's Shigeru Ban's uh, uh, idea. And this is great. You know, this is the kind of thing that you want to build, not, not, not homes. Or, this, is what, this is a condition. And, uh, and so just a simple paper tube columns and, and, and beams with uh, these cloth hanging to create a little bit of privacy. And that's what uh, I think, you know, Bon is great to, to work in this kind of thing. Um, it's, it's a very simple idea, but, but this is precious. The sense of uh, privacy in this kind of place is really. And, and I know that uh, I, I have this haircut. But the guy that cut my hair uh, in my hair salon, he went there to cut 
here. He, he, he went there in the morning in one of these places. I think his, his, his salon sent him out there as a volunteer. Uh, took a bus, went out there from Tokyo, cut for like five, six hours and came back. So there's a lot of efforts like this, not just architects, but to, to, to work with them uh, pre-building you know, building, uh, phase. But still, people build. So this is actually, I think, uh, uh, this is Harvard Graduate School Design and the Miyagi University collaboration and Keio, uh, Hiroto Kobayashi and his group build this uh, uh, community gathering space. Uh, so it's, it's really um, good for students and uh, it's a fun project and for uh, the community uh, it may be good. Another one is, uh, this is a, an architect from, all, uh, from Shikoku which is the island way west of, of Japan uh, proposed a temporary bathhouse and so he raised f uh, funds to create a series of these uh, bathhouses in places and actually I had a video of uh, people taking bath naked but I, I, I thought it was not in good taste during the dinner so I didn't put it in the but anyways uh, you can just imagine you know Japanese bath uh, you know is there so anyways challenges you know uh, I, I, I was uh, mentioning pros and cons the interface with National Reconstruction Program, how architects can engage, uh, like community architects can engage. Defining the role of architect in the reconstruction process. Uh, are we working with a planner, urban designer, architect, and it seems like in Japan at this moment, uh, when everything is all flattened out, the planners are coming in to plan, and that's a logical step. But the architects are saying, well, the planners are coming. Hey, you know, this is, this is sort of a, uh, you know, why the, the architects think that it's now the opportunity for architects to be more effective because the planners in Japan work very close with the government. And so the architects are really pushed out of this whole, whole circle. So anyway, there's that kind of professional uh, kind of a competition, which is not the way to, to be. And so how do we work together? Long-term commitment of architects in a voluntary position, pro bono, so on and so forth. Uh, how do you do it? Uh, through the professional organizations like AIA, uh, JIA, or, or, or Acacia. Versus practice, when do, you, when do you become an architect getting fees? And when do you work as a volunteer? You know, that's, that's a discussion that, that I like to hear of what, what everyone uh, thinks. Overcoming the mistrust of the residents being seen as opportunistic architects. And they say that when they come in and say, you know, can we help? The communities uh, really don't, don't in, the, in the beginning, trust these architects. Establishment of international network. Now, this, is, this happens to be in Japan, but now with the statistics of having uh, so much uh, disaster, uh, how do uh, and, and one of the ways to work in, uh, is uh, through the professional organization um, with UIA as the sort of the that the pyramid and and the uh, and the uh, sort of collector of all the the, the, the institutes and of course uh, we're talking this afternoon about the AIA and the global uh, kind of uh, strategy uh, and of course you have other organizations and the uh, regional organization they all we can collaborate somehow uh, through a network and to learn from each other and to uh, uh, prepare for anything that happens uh, you know from from this day on so anyways uh, you didn't see the naked people and you can enjoy and uh, have some discussions about uh, some of these challenges thank you thank you very much George Okay, so now comes to an unusual part of the dinner. It's the course where you're going to use your pencil and there'll be a facilitator at your table. And we've been given some fantastic ideas to talk about and think about, um, some real case studies, how people have worked in different regional areas. We're going to bring back our speakers after dinner and after this workshop for Q&A. But what we'd like to do now is give everybody a chance to put their thoughts together and 
We've broken up it down to five different groups of discussion. That's how you are at different five tables. At each table you have international experts and you have our AIA Hong Kong home experts. And if you could go to slide two. We have five uh, facilitators. At table one we have Peter Cookson Smith. And at table two we have, where it's, there she is, <laughs> Sujata Gavada. Dr. Sujata Gavada is the chair of our Hong Kong AIA Urban Design Committee and the founder of it. At table three, we have Gregory Yeager, who is based in Shanghai, and he's our co-chair of urban design. And at table four, we have Tom Schmidt, who will be leading, and um, he's been a past exco and well known to all of you, and I'll be helping the gang in the back there. Now, we're basically going to talk about what we've talked about here, but get your input. How, at what point can architects be involved? How can we best fit into any solutions that are going forward? And how can we help raise awareness, both in communities and among ourselves, for what those opportunities are? And here are the five groups. So you're landed where you are, and your um, facilitator will work with you. So table one, we'll talk about first response. Table two, we'll talk about temporary structures. Table three, the intermediate responses. Four is urban thinking, and five is rebuilding. These are very broad topics, and your facilitator will try to catch some points. And what you're all doing is adding your voice to a living document about how we can help in these events that are happening worldwide. So enjoy the workshop, and then we'll have dinner. Thank you.
Hello, hello. Hello, everybody. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I'm really happy to see all the discussions that are going on. I know our table, everybody spoke up and had an interesting viewpoint, so it's been great. What I would like to do, if, um, if we can, is actually ask the facilitators from each table to maybe share a few of the points that they've gathered, and we'll go through the five tables, and then we have our experts who um, are at our tables. We have our experts who have spoken between Clark and George. Tony had to, to leave, but we have Dominic. <laughs> and we have others, other experts in the room as well with Professor Ju and others. So let's share the facilitated points and then see if there's some natural questions that come out of that. So I'll start with table one, Peter Cookson Smith. Can I ask all the tables to give us their attention? Uh, thank you. We had a very interesting discussion. Uh, we're first in line, of course. We're talking about first response, and therefore there was a, you know, quite a lot of um, discussion uh, about quite how we defined first response. But essentially, we, we, we really felt that the first response should be a pre-response. Um, the AIA sets a very good example here, certainly in the States, with having a, a, a a program, there's a website. Um, so people have a sense of, of, of readiness. They're able to respond in, respond in terms of an emergency. The general feeling was that architects can go in first. You know, it doesn't have to be a situation where we're thinking about engineers or medics or whatever. Um, this is important. Um, we, we need to have clear avenues, therefore, of communication and organization. We need to have skills in terms of safety planning. Uh, there was a question raised, which is a, a very good question. Can we get people, uh, you know, back into their houses, back into their relatively normal lives, getting their possessions back as quickly as possible? Again, it comes to organization. Um, uh, uh, Clark from the AAA really put a, put a, put a, a very good point over that um, the AIA does have a process where architects can contribute at an early stage. Um, and, and, and courses are actually available. There's even a website available which really shows what people can actually do, how they can get involved. Uh, training needs to take into account basic aspects. Um, uh, somebody mentioned a, a life straw, a life straw uh, for situations where you have polluted water, and water is often very essential in terms of uh, uh, the volcanic activity, tsunamis, and so on and so forth. Um, it, it, it relates to elementary purification of drinking water, so things like that with an available source of th this essential kind of type of supply is also very important. Um, Problems with, you know, premature solutions, you know, so, you know, it's one thing to say that there's a first response, but you can also go in perhaps a little bit too quickly. Um, everyone trying to help, so the, 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 it, it's still very important for architects um, to act as coordinators and enablers, not as individuals, but as part of a kind of more coordinated plan. Uh, and this should stem from perhaps training exercises or a training routine. In other words, again, we come back to this issue of, of, of pre-planning rather than sort of uh, act, acting too quickly when there is an emergency. We need also to establish a network of people who are available, trained and enthusiastic. Um, a few more points. Um, could we, for example, have any kind of legislation which allows architects to to help other colleagues. Um, um, can we use disaster insurance? How best do we work with, say, the people who would obviously come first to the scene, like doctors? Component readiness. We need to enable architectural chapters to have resources through, ideally, some kind of national or regional organization. In other words, network planning. Then it also needs to be a stock of material for temporary shelter. 
Um, this, this, this is quite an important factor, we think. Um, you, you know, it, 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 it varies according to culture. We, we have high regard for Shigeru Ban's uh, curtain bamboo structure works in Japan, but it might not work elsewhere. So again, we need, we need pr preparedness, we need appropriateness in terms of architecture materials. Training processes um, should and could include building assessment. Um, and a commitment to action, we feel, should include alliances uh, with, with, uh, with other professional people who would obviously be first on the ground, like medical staff. Um, so, you know, building alliances, components of ability and affiliation, capability, um, to enable rapid assessments to be made. The, these all, of course, add up to pre-disaster preparedness. Um, in some, if not many, situations, simply donating money might, in fact, be the best first attempt, you know, rather than everybody le leaping in there with good intentions, but in a rather uncoordinated way. We do need to establish realms of preparedness, uh, and this needs to include regional liaison. Um, E.g., in, in the USA, for example, under Katrina, you know, there's, there is in America clearly a, a political and organizational structure in existence. In Sichuan, there was nothing like that at all, but there was something else. There was the PLA, five million members of the PLA, who could be, who could be brought into action literally overnight uh, through the action of the Prime Minister. And if, indeed, they were. They were going in there and they were clearing roads and they were, you know, clearing mounds of rubble and so on and so forth and, 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 and trying, to, trying to clear the way for emergency services. Um, in Sumatra, there might be a very different situation. There's virtually no situation, there's virtually no regional organization or, or, or any kind of backup. So, again, we had this issue of regional preparedness. You know, we might in Hong Kong be ready, willing, and able to... Um, help uh, 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 victims of a Sichuan earthquake, could we or would we be able to do the same if there was a, a disaster in Sumatra of the scale of the uh, tsunami a few years ago? Um, so we need organizations who can be or or can orchestrated in terms of level of appropriateness and readiness. Uh, and a final point, there needs to be a very responsive situation where, for example, the organization, the, the organizing architectural um, association can actually monitor and evaluate what's happening quite quickly. Um, uh, Dominic made the point that in Hong Kong people who actually went over there came back and then there was a sort of a assembling of ideas in terms of well what do we do next, you know, who can we send out, who is most appropriate to actually go there in terms of first or second response. So uh, that was our con conclusions, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, we're going to go to number two, which was temporary structures, and Tom Schmidt and his table. And um, if you can bring them. You guys switched. Yeah, we didn't know who we were, so we did both. Uh, because some of the people at this table were interested in urban thinking as well as temporary structures. Uh, so anyway, we had an, a very interesting group uh, here, diverse backgrounds and also uh, a very interesting discussion. And I think one of the first questions that was asked was, why is landscape architecture not considered? <laughs> So I think that, that was, uh, everybody agreed on that. And then the other thing, we did discuss temporary structures and uh, people felt that really these temporary structures are, tend to be more longer term, some places nine, ten years. So when they are actually planned and implemented or built, they shouldn't be looked upon as temporary structures, but more that they could stay for longer. So you're, uh, and I think the first thing that people mentioned also when architects or, you know, I would put in all other designers who, or planners go in, you need to understand what people really lost. What did they have in terms of their 
social fabric. And uh, so understand rather than have this one size fits all or one solution fits every situation uh, and try to see how we can provide the support initially for the people and so that they can build the trust and actually uh, learn from precedents elsewhere and mistakes that were made before so that we are not repeating the same mistakes. And I think trying to see how normal, um, regaining that normalcy and also trying to give opportunities for a fresh start because there were examples quoted of some uh, places in France where people did not even want to go back to the areas where disaster struck. And there were also comments on disaster in the future could be more human-made rather than natural disaster, so you need to be prepared. And in general, the, it was felt that we are really, as a profession, we are not prepared as much as we should be, and even as people. If you took Japan, for example, one of the, the participants was quoting, like Suvarna here, is that how in Japan the kids from when they are six years old are taught about possibilities of disasters and how to be prepared, whereas in other uh, situations like, say, U.S., India, and other places, they're not maybe as well informed. So I think awareness, education, as well as being prepared uh, ahead of time. And I think there was also a comment made about when most of the cities, I mean, people are going to be living in urbanized areas, disasters will have a different you know, impact, which will be much more. And we need to be thinking about advanced plans ahead of time rather than wait for disaster to happen and then you go in to react. And there was a, also a comment made on Hong Kong because one of the speakers said, Hong Kong, we don't have disasters. But actually, if you went back several years ago, decades ago, Hong Kong had the same typhoons we face today, but the disaster was much greater than what we have today. All, almost we don't recognize it, uh, that we have a big problem because a lot of planning and codes and everything went into it. So I think advanced planning is very important. And again, this whole thing about uh, architects not going there just to build something, but trying to see what are we trying to build. We're trying to prepare people to live a better life. And so you need to be going in not to build a building, but more to create communities. And I think that's important. And actually working with the people is very important. And another point was the cultural difference from one place to another and learning about how the people can help themselves uh, rather than just waiting to be helped uh, in these situations is important. And this would be, I think, very uh, key to have more resilient communities in the future uh, in, in the face of natural as well as human-made disasters. And if I miss some points, please chip in. Anyone? Thank you. Right. Read this all together. But I think it, it really boils on, as, as Sujata was saying, we're taught to build but we're not, and, we, and we're kind of at the last stage of the healing process of community. And what we all want to do is I think we want to be more involved earlier in the process. And I think it was very important that Clark, in his presentation on San Francisco, and how he was engaged in the political process in order to be able to facilitate change in the city of San Francisco. And I think the Embarcadero, and you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Californian, even though I grew up in SoCal versus NoCal, but, but the Embarcadero um, demolition and the restructuring of the city of San Francisco, I think, is one of the most important urban moves in the state of California, if not the United States. And I think it's ne maybe next to the big dig, but that's a different story. So, so it really is important how we as architects, as planners, as urban designers need to be engaged in our communities so that we can bring about change when situations like this happen. 
We also, I think, had a, a very interesting discussion at our table about the complexities, particularly in the Japanese situation, of people seeking and receiving help from outside their community. And there was a, like a, a desire by the government not to accept aid, not to accept assistance. So we as architects have to become more engaged in our community. We have to listen to what people are saying. We have to recognize that we're living in a community that is, it could be seen as having a terminal illness. It could be, it could be treated like having a death in the family. And you have to go through the stages of change in your life because your community has been completely ripped out from underneath you. It has been destroyed. And so it, we as architects have to be more than just builders. We have to be facilitators, we have to be listeners, we have to be translators. In some ways, we have to be more socially aware and socially minded in how we help restructure our communities. We love to pick up the pencils, we want to get out and dig in the bricks and the mortar, and we want to build things, and we're eager to do it. There was a comment that was made, we're eager, a series of conversations in the presentations, that we're eager to build, but we also need to build communities. And I think that's one of the most important things that, that we need to do. The, one of the last conversations that we had was really trying to compare the situation in the Sichuan earthquake versus the situation in Japan. And I think the, the interesting thing that we gained from the Sichuan earthquake and from the presentation by the HKIA was they actually sat and they listened to the community. They respected the values, they respected the issues, they respected the context, they respected the culture. They helped train a, a group of individuals within the community to be able to implement change. Because certain levels of trust in building and the building process were lost because at the end of the day, the deaths that impacted the Sichuan earthquake victims was in the schools and in the public facilities. And that's where the mistrust of how buildings are built and whether they're safe or not happened. Um, in Japan, we see a different situation. We see a government that is, has to think about, do they even want to rebuild? So how do we restructure our, our country and our communities for change? And, and I think part of it's about healing, but part of it's also healing the community, but also part of it is about recreating a new community because change is inevitable and change, we're going to have to deal with and adapt to change. And whether that's in Japan, whether that's in China, whether that's in, the, in New Orleans, in the United States, um, change does happen. And I think Clark's presentation it really shows how 20 some odd years, I was in the San Jose airport in 1989 and we were lucky to get out. So um, change is good and we need to be participants in the change of our, of our environment and of our world. Okay. Anything else I need to add? Thank you. Tom? Okay. Well, uh, we, um, we went through a variety of issues. Um, and I would have to say uh, we were tasked with urban thinking. Uh, and I think our discussions revolve primarily around typhoons, tsunamis, and flooding. A lot of water-related events. And one of the key things that we found was basically a resistance to change um, as it relates to uh, challenges in planning and reconstruction activities. Uh, some people brought up the issue of, you know, disasters actually offer uh, uh, actually a path to freedom and new approaches, you know, in kind of the silver lining to the cloud. Um, but also one of the problems uh, that was uh, identified was uh, uh, like temporary shelters resulting in urban sprawl that might be at odds of at, uh, how a community might be uh, replanned or, or uh, redesigned. And also one of the challenges that was brought up was rebuilding in the same unsafe locations, which was especially true for uh, some urban uh, communities. Uh, case in point, we were talking about is in Sri Lanka when um, you know, entire sections of the coastline were wiped out and then the government provided these resettlement villages uh, at higher elevations, which of course were not really well received by the fishermen who had to ha you know, drag their fishing boats back down to the shore. They're like, well, how are we supposed to make a living? Um, there's also a lot of uh, talk about the loss of ancient knowledge because there's a lot of uh, 
you know, I guess, uh, you know, traditional practices of planning and building that work with the, uh, the natural environment and, and these disasters that have been around for ages. Um, and again, this identifies a need for uh, educational programs and also engaging the older members of the community to really, you know, pick up on their, their expertise uh, in terms of traditional building techniques and planning uh, to withstand these uh, recurring uh, problems. Um, we also talked about how architects can bring, um, you know, new construction technology to withstand, uh, you know, recurring disasters. So I think, you know, uh, efforts in Japan are a, a very good example. And uh, we also talked about there were um, uh, recent infrastructure uh, developments, uh, for example, like in, um, in uh, Kuala Lumpur, where uh, there's a system of, of tunnels that actually allow traffic flow, but in the event of emergency, it could double as uh, emergency drainage for st uh, storm surges. Uh, again, getting back to the example of uh, Sri Lanka, um, you know, better urban planning along the coastline could uh, potentially uh, aid in the uh, unrestricted, un unrestricted uh, flow of water in the event of a tsunami, um, you know, through certain channels. And again, in the, um, in the issue of flooding, uh, we're talking about the floodplains, you know, a lot of us now designed to a hundred year flood event when in reality, uh, that may no longer be valid. Maybe it's actually a 10 to 15 year flood event. So the floodplain charts and the, and the data uh, that we're working to now may not even uh, be valid. Um, one, one thing that actually came up quite often was uh, the need, as a lot of other people have talked about, is the need for collaboration, uh, cross-disciplinary teams uh, in planning, urban planning, and also rebuilding efforts. Um, also, there's obviously an architectural response for the planning of, of coastal communities and other disaster-prone areas. Uh, a good example we talked about was in Holland, where there's, a, there's floating architecture, you know, uh, buildings that actually go up and down with the tides. Um, and this also relates to uh, construction requirements in some of these high-risk locations. Uh, a good example is on the east coast of the US, why, why are we still building with timber? You know, I mean, if, <laughs> if a hurricane comes through, you know, several times a year and these houses get blown away by traditional wood stud construction, why are we still using it? So um, that pretty much summarizes, I think, what we talked about. Does anybody else have any, anything else to add or? Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you, Tom. The big thoughts here, which were very interesting, we looked at four different countries and how they looked at rebuilding and everybody came down to, it's what you've done before you rebuild that really matters. How much you've talked to the people, the government, the people building, and ultimately the stakeholders who are going to live there. And we found that there were some places in Italy where they wanted exactly what they had rebuilt and they had a new appreciation for their neighbors, for everything, they just loved what they had but they're going to build it better, safer, stronger. And you had the examples in China where things really were improved. A lot of money came in, much better housing came in, a new lease on life for those who had survived the disaster and a new business opportunities. You had areas, other areas where people just wanted something better. So the ultimate, ultimately the rebuilding had the silver lining, but it was most successful where people had gotten involved and where they hadn't there was room for improvement. And then ultimately, the last question, how do we let people know how we can get involved? And the main point that came out was uh, letting people know that we can be relevant. So again, getting away from what George mentioned about coming in gung-ho to just build, but actually being relevant, having knowledge that can share, having ears that will actually hear the issues on hand and uh, through actions were the main way that we could show our relevance. And 
as AIA in this region, we can do that with this living document, with examples that people in this room have been part of, and just continuing to work with one another to create that relevance and make it shared. And we actually uncovered an interesting point, which was now in China, earthquake proof and strong buildings are getting to be the norm. People, you can't get your buildings built, even in small villages, unless they've gone through some very serious looks. Um, in America, we have to get our licensing exams. We, of course, have to know something about these lateral loads. In Hong Kong, that's not a priority. So maybe we, HKIA and AIA Hong Kong, have to work together more and make that something that we can raise awareness on. I mean, there's some very key points we can just do tomorrow. We can get, going back to Peter's point, we can pre-prepare. You know, we can get ready ahead of time. So I'd like to ask if there are any questions for our experts. Um, and dessert is on its way. I just, I just want to say this is a wonderful session and um, what it's precipitated is uh, I have to, I've been asked to do a talk at AI Baltimore about disaster preparedness and what I'd like to be able to do, Christine will talk about this, is use some of this material. Uh, and what I would also say that um, those of you who know Rachel Minery, who's uh, chair of the Disaster Task Force, she really um, she's working very hard and really um, this kind of encourage, I mean she's way ahead in trying to do a lot of the stuff that we've talked about but this only further reinforces a lot of the work that she's actually trying to put together in a way that actually is usable for, um, as I, I continue to say, for the organization as a whole and other alliances in the organization. So. This is great. This is a great opportunity, and everybody should feel good about the the contribution you're making in this. So, great exercise, Christine. Thank you. I have a small housekeeping point. Please remember to turn in your nomination forms. Vivian is going to run around and collect them. Thank you very much, and thank you to everybody for participating today. dedicated individuals who have come all the way here and participated in tonight's workshop and in our adjudication. So I would like to um, ask Jay Lee to come up and help produce the gifts for our, our guests. <laughs> and let's see, Peter is not here, but Paul Tange. Oh, yes, Peter, I said already, but the other Peter is not here. And Paul Tange? Oh, Tom Boyle. Okay. And, and Tom, we'd also like to invite you up here since you came such a long distance. Tom Boynier? And George Cunihara. Now, all our, of you are, are getting a unique gift. It's, it's a book by our very own Peter Cookson Smith. It's his newest book, and he's autographed it for you. <laughs> and, and Peter's getting a book on AIA architecture. <laughs> So again, we greatly appreciate your participation in our jury, in our events this whole week. Thank you for coming such a long distance, and it's been brilliant working with you. Thank you.